Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you will have to unmute yourself. Uh, Zoom does that to every single panelist um, as they as they join us. It just automatically mutes us. So the, on the bottom left, there will be an unmute button. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me on. And can you uh, explain to the audience a little bit about your involvement in activism and in supporting whistleblowers over over you know a long period of time? Because I really want them to understand where you're coming from in your experience with the Courage Foundation and with other whistleblowers as well as with WikiLeaks. Sure. I'm, I'm currently co-director of a group called Popular Resistance. Uh, it's popularresistance.org that came out of the Occupy movement. After Occupy encampments were closed, we met with a lot of different activists to decide how we keep building the movement and creating a new site for the movement uh, was what we decided would be helpful. So Popular Resistance was created a few years ago. I was on the um, steering committee of the Chelsea Manning Support Network almost since the day she was arrested and involved in that campaign. I've written a good deal about uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and as well as other whistleblowers. And I serve on the board of the Courage Foundation. I've been an activist uh, since uh, law school. I graduated from George Washington University in 1980 uh, during the Reagan era. And I was, while well, they were saying just say no and war on drugs, I was urging legalization of marijuana and ending mass incarceration and uh, using a harm reduction public health approach to dealing with drugs. I've worked on that issue. I still work on that issue, but I've, I've worked on a wide variety of other issues since then, uh, including uh, creating a new economy uh, where people have more control over uh, their own personal income as well as influence over the broader economy, uh, where we're working to end uh, racial injustice, uh, which is very big. I'm in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore is a racially divided city with a very aggressive police force and uh, ten to, more than 10,000 abandoned homes in the poorer communities, which are the black communities. Uh, also for environmental justice, working for dealing with climate change realistically and dealing with all the degradation of our environment, water, land, air, uh, all the species of uh, animals and plants that are under, under duress. We have a lot of problems there. And working for ending imperialism uh, and a, a world of peace. I just got back from Venezuela where I was asked to attend the uh, recent election uh, when Pre President Maduro was reelected. They wanted people to come and observe what happened because there's a media blockade where we are told lies about Venezuela and the truth is hidden. And uh, I think so much of activist work is about, it begins with unveiling the truth, breaking through the propaganda and false information and uh, letting people know what, the, what really is going on because misleading people is how the people in power keep in power. The truth is how we build a movement. And that's why I think Julian Assange is so important. Um, he has basically democratized the media with WikiLeaks. Democratizing the media, I mean that he has given people a way to report abuse uh, through the WikiLeaks uh, effort People who are in government, people who are in corporations, people who are active can send documents anonymously and they'll be reviewed and then published. Uh, and then people will know what's really happening. And he has released through WikiLeaks some of the most important uh, documents, really the most important news of the last decade. Uh, so much that we know now we would not have known so much that we suspected was true and heard rumors was true, was verified because we got, people got to see the documents. And the democratization of media uh, is such a critical component now, I think, in this 21st century where the ability of the mainstream media to manipulate the, the truth, uh, to tell their version of uh, what's happening, even if it's not consistent with reality, is more powerful with the Internet with the ability to monitor us on uh, our internet activities and gather data about us and know our concerns and our uh, issues, they can manipulate us more easily. And so it's more important than ever for activists to be involved in the battle for the narrative, the battle control of media. And WikiLeaks has been a key player in that. I think that Julian Assange persecution it's a prosecution, but it's also a persecution. Um, 
is, is really the John Peter Zenger case of the 21st century. John Peter Zenger was a U.S. colonial case that essentially established what became the First Amendment, uh, the, the freedom of the press. Uh, and we're in that same situation now. Uh, if Assange is successfully silenced and prosecuted, uh, it's an attack on freedom of speech, freedom of the press in the 21st century. We are battling over how the media will report uh, in the internet age. Will we be limited to only uh, New York Times and Washington Post and the London Telegraph and CNN and MSNBC and Fox? Or will it be a democratized media where there's independence, where individuals have power uh, to get information out, where we can share information on social media without being constrained by algorithms by Google or by Facebook, uh, but people have a real chance to tell their own narrative. And I think that Assange's case is really kind of points right to that point of the, that issue of what does free speech mean in the 21st century? What does freedom of the press mean in the 21st century? And he created a whole new kind of way for people to participate with the idea of publishing documents that show the truth uh, is a, didn't exist before WikiLeaks. You know, the, the, the Pentagon Papers were released, but that was a hard thing to do uh, in that era. Daniel Ellsbury had to photocopy thousands of pages and find the New York Times or Washington Post or someone willing to do it. I don't think they would do it today uh, because of the, the, the risks are so high. So we need an avenue where we can get those kinds of documents out, get those kind of truths out. And you can see the impact of that truth. If people forget about the impact that WikiLeaks has already had. If you go back to the early part of the Arab Spring, uh, WikiLeaks released documents about Tunisia and the abuses that were going on by the government of Tunisia. And that helped to feed the Tunisian revolt, which led to the Arab, uh, the, the whole you know, revolt in Egypt and Bahrain and other countries, which led to the uh, revolts in, uh, in Spain, uh, led to the Occupy movement in, in the United States. I mean, this all came because the truth was loud out. And uh, so it's, it's so essential that the truth makes a difference and people know what's really happening around them. They already suspect they're being lied to. The corporate media has very low credibility. Polls about uh, do you trust the media show very little faith in the corporate media. So they're already on a risky ground. And when independent media exists, when a democratized media exists, where people can have a role to play to get the truth out, it undermines the corporate media further, and it makes it harder for the corporate media to lie to us because they know the truth could come out. And their credibility is so precious that Absolutely. they have to be very careful. Um, can you speak a little bit about Julian Assange's role um, in, in the Courage Foundation and the history of that? Because that's a subject that I know that you're familiar with, but also that a lot of people don't uh, are, not, are not familiar with themselves. So if you could explain or expound a little bit on that, that would be uh, fantastic. I think people should check the Courage Foundation website uh, and donate to the Courage Foundation. It's, it was set up uh, by WikiLeaks, by Julian Assange, and by others involved in WikiLeaks in order to protect whistleblowers. And they take on the cases of individual whistleblowers and provide resources uh, to their defense. And they provide much needed attention to their defense. Uh, the Courage Foundation, I, I think, deserves a lot more support because we need uh, to have the backs of people who take the risk of telling the truth. Uh, telling the truth in this era is, is an act of civil disobedience. Uh, Julian Assange himself is showing that uh, taking that risk can have costs. Uh, he's been essentially incarcerated now uh, in the Ecuadorian embassy uh, and unable to communicate for the last recent months uh, for really no crime. Uh, he didn't do anything that deserved uh, his silence. And Courage Foundation is there to exist to help to push you know, the agenda of whistleblowers help to create an environment where whistleblowers can be more free because there are still more truths that are hidden than truths that are told. So there's a lot more work to be done, but we have to create an environment where whistleblowers feel that kind of uh, 
ability, that feel that kind of freedom where they can take the risk of letting the truth out uh, and will not be left alone uh, to face the consequences. I think one of the great sadnesses of the Assange case is the way that traditional media, which used a great deal of the information that WikiLeaks produced uh, in their reporting, as any sensible media would, if you want to cover any topic and any depth and want to really get to the truth, you should go to WikiLeaks and search for that topic because they cover all the hot topics. And that's a great place to start. So traditional media, the corporate media has used WikiLeaks. They've profited from WikiLeaks by writing stories that use their, their information, but they're remaining silent about the persecution of Assange. This should be an issue that all of the media, independent, corporate, social, all the media should be shouting loud about. Assange should stop being persecuted. He should be allowed to leave the embassy. There should be no prosecution or investigation of his effort as a reporter. And that's really, he's really more of an editor than a reporter. And that's really what uh, Courage Foundation is about, is trying to create that kind of environment. So I'd urge you to go to the Courage Foundation uh, check out uh, the website, see the cases that we're involved in, and donate to support its cause. Uh, we need a safe environment to get the truth out because we are told a lot of lies. And the truth is essential uh, to creating change. Absolutely. Um, and 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 in moving on from that, um, a very similar question is, uh, I know that a lot of people are unaware of the, the way in which Julian Assange has repeatedly stood up for whistleblowers. I mean, advocated for their, for uh, whistleblowers when they have been uh, persecuted. So could you um, reiterate to our audience a little bit about uh, WikiLeaks support for whistleblowers, their advocation, uh, their advocacy for Chelsea Manning and some other history that is, as you, as you said, not reported by the media and not reported accurately. And it, and also Edward Snowden, we, I talked about this uh, yesterday with Kieran O'Reilly, that people don't know the role that uh, Julian Assange, WikiLeaks and Sarah Harrison played in saving Edward Snowden. So if you could speak on any of that, that would be great for our audience to hear. Sarah Harris deserves a lot more uh, attention and applause for the work that she's done to support Assange, WikiLeaks and Snowden. The shirt I'm wearing, you, you've probably seen uh, Julian Assange wear uh, in the embassy. It's the truth shirt. Uh, this is a shirt that we created when I was uh, on the steering committee of the Chelsea Manning Support Committee. Uh, we were known as the Truth Gallery uh, inside the uh, courtroom uh, for Chelsea Manning when she was being prosecuted. Uh, we were not allowed to wear advocacy shirts uh, in the courtroom, and so we decided we would wear a shirt that just said truth. This was a great idea by the people who organized the steering committee. Uh, and organize the Chelsea Manning Support Network. And uh, we decided we wear the truth shirt. If they made us take off the truth or wear the shirt inside out or hide the truth, that's a victory in itself. So they were smart and allowed us to become the truth gallery. And Chelsea Manning would look back once in a while when she was being prosecuted and seeing that she was not alone. And there were a lot of people who came to her support, including Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks. Um, they were important not just in getting her story out as far as the documents that she was, the documents that she was really are amazing. I, I don't think we've even scratched the surface of the historical importance of those documents. I expect down the road, we'll see historians go back to those documents and look at the day-to-day -day re reporting of what was going on uh, in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, in Guantanamo Bay, uh, in the U.S. State Department, uh, when Hillary Clinton was the uh, Secretary of State. Uh, it's an amazing day-to-day -day history and the potential there for a historian to really tell the story of the United States as an empire, which looks like to many a fading empire. This will be a critical history. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that uh, Julian Assange deserves credit for, and of course, Chelsea Manning deserves credit for. And just on Chelsea Manning, let me just say people should really check out her uh, Senate campaign website. I believe it's XY Chelsea, but you can find it, uh, search it, uh, and uh, support her campaign. She stands for some very important issues 
on health care, on economic justice, on privacy. Uh, she's really taking some important positions, and I, I hope people will go to her site and support uh, her, her, her campaign against Ben Cardin. Cardin is a U.S. senator. I ran against him in 2006 uh, as a Green candidate. I uh, was also nominated by the Libertarian Party and the uh, Populist Party in Maryland. Although the state didn't allow me to accept those nominations, they passed a law that said I, I only could have one nomination. So I chose the Green and the other two parties endorsed me. But Ben Cardin deserves to be run against. Uh, he is behind the effort to stop the BDS movement against Israel. Uh, this is a great and important movement. He's trying to pass laws that criminalize uh, BDS. He's a classic corporate Democrat, uh, classic militarist who calls himself, uh, so, so he says he's in favor of peace, but always votes for war. Uh, and so Chelsea Manning is running against him and deserves people's support from around the world, around the United States. People in the United States can donate to her and they should. Uh, she needs your support and needs to get it out. So back to WikiLeaks though, WikiLeaks helped to propose, you know, to promote the information that she released. They helped to promote the how, how she was being incarcerated and helped to de develop a movement to uh, defend her when she was incarcerated. Uh, so they played a critical role in that. Ed Snowden, tremendously important uh, whistleblower. Uh, and uh, WikiLeaks and Sarah Harris did an amazing job of escorting him out of harm's way, uh, out of Hong Kong and into Russia and uh, into what has been safety now for a long time. Uh, and that was just a tremendous thing. And Snowden, again, his, the leaks that he portrayed, gave out, that WikiLeaks promoted were so important to letting us know the truth about how we are being spied on uh, in the United States and around the world. Uh, and how foreign leaders, elected officials around the world are being spied on by the United States. And WikiLeaks has continued to put, put, put publish uh, documents on the spying tools used by the United States and other intelligence agencies. So th these are forefront issues. And I, I have no doubt that people look, and look back at these times and try to understand them in a rear view mirror of history will rely greatly on the work of Assange and Harris and WikiLeaks um, in really um, providing us the tools, the information uh, that will give us a, a truer understanding than, you know, the New York Times that promoted the whole weapons of mass destruction lie and helped us get into the Iraq war and promotes all sorts of false, falsehoods about Venezuela uh, and, and, and other countries where the U.S. is in, in looking to, toward uh, uh, challenges and potential military conflicts. We need independent, democratized media. And that's what we need Julian Assange to be released. Uh, he needs to be able to communicate uh, through the internet. He needs to be able to continue to do his work to WikiLeaks, and they need to stop any threats of prosecution and persecution. The whole story about the Swedish charges, uh, it's just, when you look at it, it's just an absurdity. Well, there, there weren't ever, ever charges, but the, the allegations, right. the investigation, yes. And it, there were enough to hold him uh, in, you know, threat of being sent to Sweden. And, you know, three prosecutors rejected pursuing the charges. They found one prosecutor finally willing to investigate it. And that caused, that really became the source of this. Of course, Sweden is a very close military ally, as is the UK, of the United States. And this was always a conspiracy to silence Julian Assange because he was doing something very simple. He was telling the truth. He was letting the truth escape into the public sphere. And so, People knew what was really happening, and when you know what's happening, uh, you're going to fight against it, because what's happening is often war crimes, often violations, violations of international law, and certainly working against the interests of the people on the planet. And so that's why he's being persecuted, and that's why he needs to be stopped being persecuted, and that's why all of the media needs to be clamoring for his freedom and for the end of this kind of persecution of Assange. Absolutely. And when you mention uh, the legacy uh, media outlets like the New York Times, you know, using WikiLeaks information and then advocating basically for his persecution, um, it, it's completely horrifying to see that and, and so hypocritical. 
But right. then uh, in addition to legacy press, though, we have an independent media sort of niche growing, which would not be able to exist without WikiLeaks and its documents. And and I think that, so the impact, as you've said, the impact is absolutely unimaginable. If we hadn't had WikiLeaks, the entire world, the landscape of history would have been completely different and just the incredibly. The Arab Spring may not have even been. And uh, who knows what would have happened in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, these, uh, as the truth gets out, that changes the course of history. And uh, it really undermines U.S. empire. Who would... You know, the, look at look at the uh, importance of the documents on Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State. Uh, she told her diplomats in the United States to spy on diplomats coming to the United Nations. She actually signed off on spy on these people. Uh, yeah. It was am it's amazing, and uh, that's a criminal offense. Exactly. And she was doing that. And, and, you know, so that needed to be exposed. And, and so did this exposure around the 2016 election. We didn't know. As much as the uh, people who are uh, upset that Hillary Clinton lost hate to admit it, Hillary Clinton was exposed. Uh, and not because uh, she was exposed because of who she was. As she said in one of the emails that was exposed, she's a two-faced person. She says one thing in private and another thing in public. Well, the only thing we know the truth is if someone's going to expose it then. So that makes the, when you have politicians like Hillary Clinton, you need a WikiLeaks uh, to get the truth out. And so tremendous impact and tremendous importance. And, and that's why he's being persecuted the way he is, because what he's done has had an impact on the direction of the United States and the direction of the world. Absolutely. And the, the content of those documents, as you're, as you're saying, is so damning that that's why we see this massive uh, effort to smear Julian Assange and distract and deflect from that content. Because uh, as we were talking about last night, you know, you have people like Chris Cuomo on CNN saying, don't look at these documents. It's illegal to do so. I mean, the desperation of media in trying to get people to look away from that information is almost hilarious at some stages. But. It was a very funny thing during the Chelsea Manning trial. Um, the defense had sent, uh, introduced, a, put in a motion, I can't remember what it was about, but the motion talked about WikiLeaks. And um, for some reason, the prosecution never responded. It came up in court and it was discussed and the prosecutor said they didn't see it because they weren't allowed to look at things that said WikiLeaks. Can you believe incredible. that? No, that's incredible. Isn't that crazy? It's insane. So, you're not allowed to see the, the word WikiLeaks or it's just, wow, bizarro, bizarro world. And, and you know, we, we, I've seen so many times of uh, people in the government telling their staff they're not allowed to go to WikiLeaks website, not allowed to look at WikiLeaks documents. The truth is that frightening. I mean, they're really caught a lie. And how could it be? All they do is release documents, you know, that's they, they, and, and put bullet points about, and summarize the documents, you know, so they're not in the business of creating, uh, you know, writing the news, uh, taking a White House press release as the, you know, some papers do and publishing as if it's news. Uh, they, they actually publish real documents uh, that tell the truth. So they've never been caught a lie. And yet they're, People who work in government, people who are told not to read WikiLeaks. The truth is just too scary. They just can't handle the truth. It's just, it's sadly, embarrassingly funny, uh, but it's reality. Absolutely. And I know that, uh, and we know that there have been huge attempts to shut down WikiLeaks' ability to verify and publish those documents. Uh, I believe there was a PowerPoint published that showed that they were going to try to submit false documents in order to discredit WikiLeaks. And I'm, I think it's really um, to their credit that they've been able to verify accurately and dismiss any sort of fault for all of these years and that retain that 100% accuracy record. That's a very unprecedented. Big because any, any, any movement, and I consider WikiLeaks kind of a movement, it's a movement for democratized media, any movement is going to be infiltrated. Uh, and infiltrators use various tools. I think one you just described, false information, is a classic infiltration tool to try to undermine the credibility of WikiLeaks by submitting false documents and WikiLeaks rushing to publish them. But WikiLeaks doesn't rush to publish them. They actually do verify. Uh, and that's not an easy task. And I'm sure they've avoided publishing false documents as a result of that. But you, 
So it's a very difficult job to tell the truth because there are people who don't want you to have that credibility. When you tell the truth, you're going to be under attack because they don't want that narrative told. And so you're going to expect to have infiltrators. You're going to expect to have false documents submitted. It's going to take a lot of work. And you're unfortunately going to expect what Julian Assange is facing, which is being silenced and being persecuted and threatened essentially with life in prison for never telling a lie. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> that reality is so incredible. I mean, we all, uh, a lot of our viewers ag agree and know that, but really facing it is still, still mind boggling. And can you um, give your insight to our audience on how you feel they can empower themselves in supporting whistleblowers and Julian Assange and WikiLeaks? Great point. Great question. I mean, I think what we're seeing right now is the media is uh, becoming a activism battleground. Uh, there's a real fight going on. You've seen all this kind of uh, uh, attempts by Google to suppress uh, left progressive websites. You see it on Facebook trying to control what media people see. Uh, you see it in the whole this whole fake news uh, meme, which has been used to silence uh, independent and social media. Uh, and so activism these days requires us to be media activists. Uh, and we need to start to think of ourselves as media outlets. Uh, it wasn't, you know, possible uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, for people to have, you know, thousands of people following them uh, in, in the media. I mean, there are people who now, activists who now have followers on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and social media and other forms that are the size of a small newspaper or even the size of a, a, a small uh, TV news show. Uh, and, and, and so I think if we can figure out how to use that new power in an effective way, uh, we can overwhelm uh, the mainstream corporate media. Uh, and so I think we need to, we haven't figured out how to do this yet. I think some are doing it, it's kind of happening organically in that people share stories uh, with intention uh, and I think if we kind of court, can find ways to better coordinate our efforts, we can do that. Now, WikiLeaks is a basically a source of news for us. Uh, and so they put out material, and then we have our own media outlets, our own social media, our own websites, our own ability to write independent media stories that get published. People have, democratized media means people play a role. And so you, you, need, you need to take on that responsibility. Um, I have no doubt that when we do so, we have a greater influence than cable TV news does. Yeah, and definitely. Fact, yeah. The show. I was just going to say, they, um, as uh, you have whistleblowers and um, individuals on social media gaining thousands and thousands of followers, as you said, uh, the size of small, uh, small newspapers, you also see the cable news and the legacy press really falling down in ratings and viewership. Um, exactly. Do you think that that's, um, I know that a lot of that is, is from just the rise of the internet age, but do you think that WikiLeaks has also played a role in revealing how corrupt and hypocritical the media is itself and its role in the unelected power structure? That's a really good point. I mean, I think as more truth is told, the credibility of the corporate media, the traditional mainstream media is undermined. They can't get away with telling falsehoods. Uh, when there's other sources telling truthhoods. <laughs> uh, and WikiLeaks is a source for that information. And uh, I was going to also add to that point about our role as a democratized media. We need to think of ourselves as a democratized media and take that responsibility on. Uh, our role, I think, research is already starting to show. There was a study done by a Harvard uh, researchers that looked at the impact of independent media. And they found that when independent media takes on a story, various independent media outlets tell the story, and it's echoed, that it changes public opinion. Uh, I suspect we are just scratching the surface of that potential. And I suspect also that the uh, power holders, the people in power, uh, know that. And that's why we're seeing the attack on net neutrality. That's an issue we're very involved in. I would urge people to uh, check out our net neutrality campaign on popular resistance, get involved and protect our internet uh, because we're in a big fight right now uh, to preserve net neutrality, which is also about democratized media. Um, and that's where they're fighting back on the, algor the algorithms with search functions, with 
going after Facebook, sharing social media, uh, with Twitter blocking uh, some feeds when they don't like what's being said. Uh, this is a this is a conflict. Uh, this is this, this, the history is constantly the battle between people power and the power holders, and uh, people power uh, needs to constantly uh, grow and get organized. And uh, there are multiple fronts of struggle that we're fighting on. We're fighting on economic inequality, fighting on racial disparity. We're fighting on environmental injustice, wars. Uh, imperialism, uh, but one of the big fronts of struggle is media. And we are on the, ver on the beginning era, and WikiLeaks deserves credit for really being one of the key uh, parts of this new era of democratized media. And we're at the beginning stage of that. I don't think we've even understood yet uh, the potential of our power. Uh, and so I, I'd urge uh, individuals uh, to work with other people in their communities coordinate uh, their social media and independent media activity. I urge organizations, we're trying to do it at Popular Resistance. We can do it better. We, we want to do it better. Uh, we're trying to do it at Popular Resistance in to get people working together in a coordinated way to really um, um, you know, put forward a democratized media message so that uh, the conflict between people power and the power holders uh, gradually moves to people power getting stronger. And we see that happening, by the way. You know, uh, we're, we're in the, right now in the midst of a, uh, a school on popular resistance. Uh, you can, on popular resistance on the top banner is a label called school. Uh, we're going through uh, eight classes. I think we're in the sixth class right now on social movements and how they develop and how they win. And uh, there are, there's a real urge. People want to know what they can do to be successful and be impactful as activists. And there's a lot we can do. We see the movement growing tremendously. Uh, there's a research that shows that if 3.5% uh, of the population gets mobilized on issues where there's a national consensus, the movement always wins. Always. Over the last 100 years, looking at social movements, 3.5% active, on a, a area of national consensus, the movement has always won dictatorship or democracy. It doesn't matter what kind of government, the people have won in those situations. They win with less than 3.5%. You can win the 1%, but at 3.5%, they always win. And think about the power of it. I mean, people might remember the Occupy movement, how it made everyone so nervous in the power structure. There was the FBI and Homeland Security were having regular conference calls with police departments around the country. What are we going to do about Occupy and these encampments? Uh, we looked at that at the time. That was only one-tenth of one percent of the population active. Wow. One-tenth of one percent. So you can imagine, we think we're at about one percent now. When you look at the various pipeline battles, when you look at the Black Lives Matter, the fight for fair wages, the fight against uh, this whole debt generation, that's in leaving school, it's massive debt, all these various fronts of struggle. We have to about 1% of the public is active now. So we've gone, we've grown a good, even though it doesn't, you know, have the, the we're not all concentrated like we were during Occupy. It's now spread over a lot of different issues, but the movement is growing. And, uh, and so I think if we are able to keep that movement informed about the truth, about what's going on, that's why WikiLeaks is so important. They're a key, key tool for getting the truth out. If we can keep that movement informed about what's really going on, we see the 2020s as a tremendous opportunity for real transformational change. There are so many issues that the uh, governments are either neglecting, uh, lying about, or mishandling that are crisis issues. Poverty and homelessness, war and uh, healthcare, uh, racism, the climate change, these are crisis issues that are being mishandled or ignored. And so that they're going to come to a peak in the 2020s at the same time that this movement, which began in the, with, let's say, the Occupy area with a takeoff of one-tenth of one percent, now is one percent mobilized, we see it continuing to grow. And the key to grow, one of the key parts of growth is people knowing the truth. Uh, because we are told a lot of lies, uh, you know, about so many issues. Often you can look at the name of a law 
and it's usually the opposite of what. So take the Patriot Act. It should be called Very the anti- amazing point. Anti Patriot Act. <laughs> you know, uh, you can go almost almost any law and and say. Affordable Care Act? No, no. It's the Unaffordable Care Act that avoided the real solution, which was national improved Medicare for all. So uh, so getting that truth out is fundamental to building the movement. Uh, once people have a foundation of knowledge and can tell truth from fiction, then they can organize in their communities, then the movement grows. We're in this phase right now of movement development that's called the um, national consensus phase. It's the phase before victory. There's, there's a history of movements called the, that describes the eight stages of successful social movements. Stage four is the takeoff, that would be Occupy. Stage six is the, movement, the stage we're in right now. Stage seven is success. Stage six is the movement where you develop national consensus. And you can see that developing. You can look at polls on, uh, on, on climate change, on health, on single-payer health care, on net neutrality, on all these. We have 65, 75, up to 90% support on these kinds of issues. And you're seeing different kinds of people getting involved. It's a cross-partisan, too. Some of these issues go across, like net neutrality. You have more than 80% support for net neutrality among Republicans. Uh, and you're seeing even uh, large minorities of Republicans now moving towards supporting single-payer health care, despite their leadership trying to stop it. You see super majorities of Democrats supporting single-payer health care, despite the, the people in charge opposing it. Um, and so we're seeing this national consensus develop. And the root of that national consensus starts with getting the truth out, piercing the lies, getting the truth out, and WikiLeaks' effort at helping to democratize the economy with the ability to get out documents through their system so people can see the truth for themselves, truths that can't be denied. Because here's the document with Hillary Clinton's name on it saying, spy on diplomats. You know, here's a document that shows, uh, the video that shows the collateral damage murder uh, in Iraq. You know, you have, here's the documents that show what was going on in Guantanamo Bay when three people were suddenly killed or died. They were, they, they were supposedly suffocated themselves, but obviously the facts are they didn't. Uh, and, and, and so these truths get out. And that's how you develop that national consensus that breaks through the corporate mainstream media barrage of falsehoods and lets the truth be told, lets people understand, let them share among their networks through their social media so that we overtake the narrative and the movement becomes a people power movement that's more powerful than power holders and create a political climate where it doesn't matter who's in office because the political climate demands that people in power do what the what the people, organized people want. And we've seen that before in history. Uh, you know, we saw the civil rights movement, the Dixocrats, the Southern Democrats were overwhelmed by the civil rights movement. They had no, the Democrat Party had no, no choice but to support civil rights laws. We saw it in the Nixon era uh, where he had to create the Environmental Protection Agency. He had to help to pass the National Environmental uh, Policy Act, NEPA, the Clean Air Act got improved, the Clean Water Act got All these things happened despite his politics because people power was so strong that no matter who was in office, had and we saw it recently with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which WikiLeaks was very key on, by the way. They yeah, really, please tell us about that. Please please expound on that because that's a really important issue. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we were very involved in a campaign to stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership and working with lots of other organizations to do so. This was a People might remember, it's, it's, it's been a while now, but at the beginning of our campaign, the, the TPP, the trans Partnership, was a secret agreement being negotiated in secret with 600 corporate advisors, transnational corporate advisors, helping to write it in secret. Congress was not allowed to even see the U.S. proposals or the drafts until the very end, after lots of pressure, they could... Finally, in the last few months of it, they were allowed to go to a room in the Capitol, leave their phone, pencil, paper, not allowed, just go and read it, but not allowed to record anything in it. You know, it's crazy. They call that, they call that a democracy. It's absurd. Um, but TPP was a secret. And uh, we started a campaign years ago uh, to challenge that. 
Uh, and as we started to get exposed, uh, there began to be some leaks, thanks to WikiLeaks, of some of the negotiating documents. And uh, we got to see the positions of U.S. negotiators, which were, of course, not something they wanted us to see. We got to see the positions of the United States in comparison to other countries. What those always showed was the United States was way, way far away from all the other countries as far as U.S. being the most pro-corporate, pro-Wall Street, you know, pro-transnational corporate big business perspective. And all that helped to fuel it. As the facts get out, that helps us to build the movement. And so what developed out of that was a movement of movements, which is what you need to win. You cross all these different barriers. Uh, you have the internet movement worried about internet freedom. You have the healthcare movement worried about the ability to put in place a single payer healthcare system. You have the food and, and, and water movement worried about food safety. You have workers worried about jobs and wages. Uh, you have uh, the environmental movement worried about degradation of the environment, the climate change. So all these movements came together and created a movement of movements about a secret agreement because so much was exposed that we knew enough about it. So a movement was created that can't be stopped and changed the political culture. So Hillary Clinton, who was the Secretary of State uh, in the administration that was pushing the TPP, it began under George W. Bush, but really escalated under, uh, under Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she had to come out against it. Uh, so Rob Portman, who was a senator from Ohio, and who had before that been the U.S. Trade Representative under George W. Bush, he had to come out against it. Donald Trump came out against it. They were all against it. Everyone had to be against it. If you were running for office, you had to be against it. And that's because the social movement was well enough informed uh, through uh, the activities of the movement, through the leaks of WikiLeaks and, and information getting out about what, the, what was, in the, was in the document, uh, and well enough informed that you had no choice but to against it. And so, you know, President Obama was not giving up, though. And I think while people like to blame Russiagate for Hillary's defeat, I think there's lots of reasons. Hillary herself is the main reason. But President Obama pushing the TPP right up to through the election, he kept pushing the TPP, even though the public was against it, he kept pushing it. That didn't help Hillary. Uh, in fact, we were prepared for a, uh, a, a train. We had an action camp in Washington, D.C. planned right after the election for the lame duck session uh, between Obama and Trump because President Obama was going to push, try to push the TPP through the lame duck session when people in Congress wouldn't be held responsible for their votes. And uh, on the day before our camp started, as the lame duck session was about to begin that Monday, on that Friday night, Obama faced reality and said, I'm not going to push it in the lame duck because I don't have the votes. So we won as our action camp was beginning, which required us to change what we were going to do, how we were going to, what we were going to protest, and we had a very effective weekend of activity. But then Donald Trump also signed off on stopping the TPP. He took all the credit, of course, but really it was a movement of movements that Absolutely. made it possible for anyone. And WikiLeaks exposed, we, we, we always were waiting as we were fighting uh, the TPP because WikiLeaks was getting out various documents uh, from the negotiations. We we're always hoping for that next document to come out uh, to help us energize the next phase of the movement. But it was a critical factor, I think, in the TVP was getting those kinds of documents out, letting us know what was really going on uh, behind closed doors in those secret meetings. And so we stopped a very dangerous trade agreement. Uh, hopefully we'll stop NAFTA as well. We need to move trade away from uh, corporate trade. It's not free trade. People call it free trade as a propaganda tool. Don't ever use that term. This is, these are corporate trade agreements designed to ensure corporations profit from low wages and easy access to natural resources, regardless of the impact of the impact on the environment. Uh, that's what these trade agreements are about, and that's why people oppose them. And the reason why they kept the trade agreement secret, as one of the uh, U.S. trade representatives uh, for the U.S. said, if people knew what was in it, they would oppose it. How honest is that? If people knew what was in it, they would oppose it. And that's, again, a great example of why truth is so important. Because if people know what's in it, they're going to oppose it. And that's just not true with trade. That's true with the, the land grabs that are happening in the United States now on, 
on public lands being used for oil and gas development. That's true with the pipelines being put across people's private lands and agriculture areas. Uh, that's true with the whole climate um, uh, policies that are being put in place, the worker policies being put in place, the racially unfair justice system, any issue along these lines, when people know what's going on, they're going to oppose it. And, and so this is, and so this is yet, and so like the, the, the TPP movement is yet another issue that WikiLeaks has been instrumental in. And there are so many issues like this where their involvement can be easily um, deflected from and forgotten by the public. And I love what you were saying earlier as well about the fact that it only takes a very small percentage of the population to make it unstoppable. And I feel like our, but, it, that's a but, really positive but, message. But that, that, that only works if the small number of people are supporting a national consensus, which requires information. Exactly. People need to be educated to develop that national consensus. Then a small percentage of people can be active and force the change to happen. But the, the, the foundational issue is honest information, is the truth, is education. And so the, democratizing the media the way WikiLeaks has done is essential for transformational change. Without it, it doesn't happen. Without it, the lies survive. With it, the lies are undone. Absolutely. So extremely true. And and I think that um, in supporting WikiLeaks, I feel that our viewers should absolutely understand that their involvement in democratizing the media, as you were saying earlier, we are all individually part of that effort and that their voices are effective and tangibly make a difference in all of these issues, you know, the movement of movements that you're, that you're speaking about. And I wanted to just ask, uh, we have about 10 minutes left in this segment. I wanted to ask about um, your personal um, evolution in how you became became an activist, what, what woke you up, uh, so to speak, in, you know, and, and led you on the path of being such a, a voice for uh, truth in, 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 and the democratization of media? That's a great question. I mean, um, I've been awoken many times in my life. So it's not just one event. I continue to be awakened these days. I'm, we're always learning more. What initially got me involved in activism uh, in a, in a more than just as a high school kid going to protests, which I did that too. Uh, I went in college, my first protest was an anti-racist protest in Boston during integration. And that was the first time I ever played a role beyond just being a, someone at a protest. I was actually put in security, which put me on the front lines of the protest, which meant that was the first and only time I was attacked by police on horseback. Horses are pretty big. So that was, that, that was, but that was before my awakening. My, <laughs> my awakening really happened when I was in law school. I planned on going to law school to be a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, constitutional law was my interest and in fighting for people's rights was my, was my hope as a career. And uh, I was uh, put into a, an internship at Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. I ended up becoming their national director and chief counsel after I graduated. But as my intern phase, I, um, uh, my first job was responding to mail from prisoners and their families. And that was a great lesson uh, to read the stories. And it was often racially unfair, of course. Our system of racial injustice has existed since the founding of the country, but has really escalated. Uh, as the civil rights movement grew and uh, African Americans got more rights, we also saw the prison population grow uh, almost as a counter reaction uh, to civil rights being provided. But my awakening of uh, reading um, letters from prisoners and their families committed me to uh, trying to end mass incarceration, and end the drug war, and end the prosecution of people for uh, consuming marijuana. And that continues as a project I continue to work on. Um, and uh, it's one of many projects that we, issues that we, fronts of struggle that we work on. Uh, but that, that's one of them. My, my eyes got more awoken um, in the Clinton era when Bill Clinton was president, uh, and I saw him um, you know, ending welfare for people who need it, people who are desperately in poverty. I saw him putting in place these corporate trade agreements. He was the author of NAFTA. Uh, he also undermined regulation of big finance. He also put a general in charge of the drug war, which is crazy. It's a health problem. You put a general in charge of it. So that, the Clinton era was an awakening for me and many others. I see a lot of people 
who left the two-party uh, system, the corporate duopoly, uh, during the Clinton era. And I haven't voted for a Democrat or Republican uh, since that time period. Uh, during this century, uh, I, I, I worked with Ralph Nader. Uh, I was Ralph Nader's spokesperson in 2004, his press secretary. And that was a lesson in itself and an awakening as well. That was the second time that I was in an office that was receiving death, death threats. 2004, Ralph was at his most unpopular because of the false accusations of 2000 that uh, he, he was the reason why Bush was president, when in fact the reason why Bush was president was Gore. <laughs> I mean, Gore was a terrible candidate. Uh, millions of Democrats voted for Bush in Florida, and that's why Gore was president. Uh, Gore lost the presidency uh, to Bush, but Nader was blamed. And we got death threats. We also got death threats when I was at normal. Those are the two times in my life where I've gotten, I've been involved in uh, work that results in death threats. But Nader was a great example of standing up to the power structure and the false media narrative. Uh, we had there was constant fight of falsehoods, uh, and so I started to see there. Uh, the importance of having an ability to combat uh, the corporate media, uh, which is filled with lies. And of course, that became also very evident during the Iraq war, uh, when essentially the New York Times was publishing Dick Cheney's press releases uh, with the false claims of weapons of mass destruction as if they were news. You know, they published it on a Sunday, Dick Cheney would go on to meet the press and refer to the New York Times as if it was fact when it was just his press release. Uh, and so as you get more involved in these kind, this kind of work, you see that the, the foundational issue is the ability to get the truth out. Uh, and that's why Assange was so strategic. I don't know how, I, I've never discussed it with him. I've never talked to him. Uh, so I don't know whether, how, how conscious he was of what he was doing. Uh, but looking at it as if he thought about it, uh, it was a very strategic move to find this new vehicle in the internet age to get the truth out and empower people uh, to be part of the media. Uh, and for that to come at the same time that social media developed, it became a, a, a source for a tool for us. You know, if you, 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 can, you can't be a, a successful social media advocate if you're gonna put out false information because you have no credibility either. And so we need places like WikiLeaks and the documents they put out to write us the tools, the ammunition uh, to get the truth out. That collateral murder video that Chelsea Manning released through WikiLeaks had a tremendous impact on people's understanding of how the U.S. operates uh, and was committing war crimes uh, during the Iraq war. Tremendous impact. That had more impact than uh, you know, years of reporting by all, all the corporate media sources, uh, even if they were critical of the uh, Iraq war, seeing that video, seeing those documents uh, that show what was going on every day in Iraq had much more impact. Uh, so my awakening, my awakening has been constant and continues to be. I'm always looking to be awakened by others. Thank you so much, so, so much for being with us and sharing your time and your insights with us and describing to us the, the just irreplaceable nature of WikiLeaks and how they've democratized the media and the truth. Thank you so much. And their advocacy for whistleblowers, of course. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being part organizing this. I think it's so essential. We'll be doing an event at the White House on the anniversary of uh, Assange going into the Ecuadorian embassy on June 19th. Uh, we'll be doing an event outside the White House that day. People should keep that in mind. It'll be at 11 o'clock on June 19th. So keep that in mind as a date to participate in standing up for Julian. That is a fantastic point. And I will definitely make sure to get out uh, to, to make sure we broadcast the information on that. If you want to send us some links we can put in the chat after, after we uh, get off air, that would be fantastic. And I'll do that. All right. Appreciate Thanks a lot for the work. It.